Hello, and welcome to the New Lines podcast, where we delve into some of the biggest ideas, events, and personalities in the Middle East and beyond. Today's episode is part of the magazine's new series focusing on histories and philosophies. I'm Kevin Blankenship. Joining me today is William Maynard Hutchins, Professor Emeritus in the Philosophy and Religion Department of Appalachian State University and an award-winning translator of Arabic literature. His best-known translation is the Cairo Trilogy by Naguib Mahfouz, who won the 1988 Nobel Prize for Literature. The trilogy follows the life of Kyrene merchant Asayed Ahmed Abdel Jawed and his family across three generations, from 1919, the year of Egyptian revolution against British occupation of Egypt and Sudan, to almost the end of the Second World War. Aside from Naguib Mahfouz, William has translated the work of more than a dozen Arabic authors, including Tawfiq al-Hakim, Noel al-Sadawi, and Ibrahim al-Koni. These translations have received awards and prizes from the National Endowment for the Arts, the American Literary Translators Association, and the Bani Pal Trust for Arab Literature. Since retiring in 2019, William has had many published or forthcoming translations. They include Ibn Arabi's Small Death, a fictionalized confession of the 13th century mystic Ibn Arabi by Saudi novelist Muhammad Hassan Adwen, I'm in Seattle, Where Are You?, the memoir of Iraqi journalist Murtada Aghzar and his gay love affair with an American soldier, and a collection of short stories by Kuwaiti journalist Fatima Yusuf Al Ali. Hi, William. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hello. I'm uh, happy to do it. Before we talk about Arabic literature and translation, I'm aware that you've studied in two places that I myself was lucky enough to study in. Uh, the Center for Arabic Study Abroad, or CASA, program in Cairo, and the University of Chicago. In fact, I think you were in the same CASA cohort as another accomplished translator, Humphrey Davies, who, as you may know, passed away last year. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about how you got interested in Arabic and literary translation, and perhaps something of the social and political context of your grad school days. Okay, so at the age of eight, I started French lessons. And as a teenager, I spent a semester in Paris studying French at the Alliance Francaise. And by the time I graduated from college, I thought I was pretty clever in French. And I got a job teaching English for a year in Lebanon hmm. at a private school. And people said, well, you need to learn Arabic, don't you? And I said, well, of course, that would be fun. Yes, let's do it. Not realizing quite what that meant. And ever since, I've been thinking I would get my Arabic as good as my French once was. And, and that's, that may happen, but may not. <laughs> it, it's just a, a different kind of language. So I kept thinking I'll just do Arabic one more year and then that will be good. And it's never quite enough. Yeah. At the University of Chicago, some random friend of a friend chastised me for studying Arabic because he said nothing's ever been written in it. <laughs> <laughs> and and that was just, you know, a challenge. You know, I'm going to show you. <laughs> and at that time, there were various medieval authors I was really excited about. And El Jahez was one. And I embarked on a program, or I mean, my own little program to translate some of the essays of El Jahez. And I had one of my classmates, both from Chicago and, and in uh, Cairo, chose a scold, and we were going to do this together. Um, unfortunately, though, he got gunned down on the streets of Chicago before we could do that. Oh, my goodness. So that was, a, I mean, it was a, a shock. But um, also, it was the worst possible project for a young translator because it's hideously difficult medieval Arabic. And, ad and admirably, you did come out with a, with a whole volume of nine essays of al Jahiz, is what it's called, for those of you who, uh, who might have heard of it or, or aren't familiar with it. It's a wonderful yeah, wonderful work. that was that that was 20 years later when I got that and it's dedicated um, to Joe. So um, my my first real job was teaching Arabic at the University of Ghana, and I taught there for three years. And we had a very small but very excellent program, which was geared obviously to the Muslim north of Ghana. And I was looking for something I could do with my students. And I had we, we had a study abroad program in Cairo. We didn't have that many students, but they were some of them were really, really excellent. So I hit on the idea of doing plays by Tafik al Hakim hmm. and thinking that we would kind of collaborate on that. So that's that's really where I got seriously interested in, in um, translation. And um, I did get separated from my students for various reasons, um, no internet at that time. 
but um, I did publish plays, prefaces, and postscripts of Tafik Alakim with Three Continents Press, and, and that was my first publication. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, Tawfiq al-Hakim, I mean, you're, 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 as I mentioned in the intro, your best known translation probably is Naguib Mahfouz's Cairo trilogy, but you've said before that Tawfiq al-Hakim actually had more of an impact on your, on your career than Mahfouz. Could you briefly say uh, a little bit more about that? Okay. The reason I was chosen by American University and Cairo Press to translate the Cairo trilogy was a very nice Egyptian woman had translated the third volume of the trilogy, which didn't make too much sense because it's third volume. Then um, the press hired a very nice Canadian person to revise that and then hired the very nice Canadian person to translate the first volume. And that didn't work out. So they hired her very nice Canadian husband to revise that. And what they ended up with was a huge mound of a huge manuscript, which they stored safely in a closet, which they judged to be unpublishable. Mm. And that was just sort of the way things were for several years and became increasingly embarrassing. (laughs) <laughs> so they asked me, and I did have a, a portfolio with the plays of Hakim that I had published, and Arnold Tavell said, just just do it, do whatever it takes. Hmm. So it was it was your translations of Tawfiq al-Hakim that sort of put you on their radar, and from there you were you got involved in the Cairo Trilogy project. Right. That that was my, you know, my bona fides. Right. Then uh, I'm aware that once Mahfouz was awarded the Nobel Prize, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis became involved and she bought the rights to the trilogy for Double Day and even edited the volumes herself. Can you say a little bit more about what it was like working with her and, and, and how that process came to fruition? Well, this was the beginning of the internet age, and Doubleday had not embraced it. And I was using my computer as a typewriter. (laughs) Um, I would mail her 80 pages at a time, and she, in her pencil, would very politely but firmly go down the margins and write me little comments. She didn't like this, or, you know, was that really right? And little love notes, so to speak, (laughs) you know, happy, happy, whatever, translator day. (laughs) And she was very thoughtful, uh, very polite. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a nicer editor. That's It's so interesting to hear this different side of a, a pe- person that I think a uh, public figure that a lot of people are familiar with from one aspect, but, but maybe not another. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the trilogy itself. You know, these books in the minds of many people represent three eras of Kyrene sociopolitical life. They're a microcosm of early 20th century Egypt through the life of this one well-off Cairo merchant and his uh, his descendants, his children and his grandchildren. And people often compare the trilogy to Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, both in terms of its epic sweep and also the psychological role of, of time itself. And do you think that's a fair comparison? How does time work as a theme in the books and, and change? And how does that impact the lives of the characters? I'm not really going to try to to do that in, in a minute. That's That's a huge thing. It is obviously a novel about the trajectory of one family as it plays out against the trajectory of one nation. And that, that's that been a really very popular way to approach the Arabic novel in the 20th century and now in our century. And so just to show how that carries on still in the past, well, 2021 and 2022, I've got five books that have come out. So I'm, I'm really, I'm 77. And that just feels like, oh, okay, I can still do it. That's amazing. And one of these is Hasuna Masbahi called Solitaire. And it's about a retired Tunisian professor celebrating his 60th birthday, uh, while thinking through his life and visiting with friends. And, and that's, that's, again, very much like the trilogy. I mean, it's totally unlike the trilogy, but it's, it's like the trilogy in, the, in terms of um, locating a person's life or a family's life in the, the history of the, the country. Right, right. Yeah, it reminds me of, of something Mahmoud Darawish said about uh, the universal always kind of starting with you know, an individual personal story, um, and then you can extrapolate from there uh, or not, depending on uh, depending on the story. Mahfouz's legacy, I think, has been at top of mind lately. Uh, there was a book released last year, the story of the banned book by Mohammed Shoyer, 
and it's in posthumous translation by Humphrey Davies. And it's about Nagi Mahfouz's most controversial work, Children of the Alley. And so I, following up, I guess, on the point you just made, what's the legacy of the Cairo trilogy and, and Mahfouz in general? Uh, and why is it still worth reading? Okay, so that requires a 200-page answer, but one page out of that 200 pages is that the third volume, Sugar Street, the fortunes of the family have totally reversed, and um, the patriarch is confined to the house and isn't striding about the universe and protecting his family. And instead, the family is protected by a gay grandson. And I think there's a, a very respectful perceptive description of this gay grandson and his boyfriend and uh, the gay politician that they end up, they, they get into the government working for him. And chapter um, 50 of Sugar Street has this gay government official going off on pilgrimage. And, and there's a, this very sort of adult, kind of sweet portrayal of, of gay Cairo life um, that's not that common. Okay, just, just one last thing. Um, somewhere, somewhere um, Yassim's mother dies somewhere, and I think it's in the second volume. Um, and he goes to, he's sort of estranged from her, and he goes to visit her. And I was sitting in my office concrete black wall and everything, uh, weeping. <laughs> and, you know, if, and I'm hoping no one would come in and ask me <laughs> for advice on whatever the homework assignment. Um, it, it's that sort of book that I think can, if you let it get hold of you, it will. Yeah, absolutely. Still, these stories still resonate, even though they were written decades ago. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the, you know, the portrayal of gay Cairo life, because you know, as you as you're probably aware, books like the Yakopian Building by Ala El Aswani have gotten a lot of attention for uh, for for portraying that side of uh, and, and other sides of of Kyrian life. Um, you know, but this is Nikki Mahfouz was already working on this decades ago. Very interesting. Now, if I could turn to your recent work, you mentioned one title, which is Solitaire. Um, do you want to mention a couple of other ones briefly that uh, listeners should be aware of? Oh yeah, absolutely. What's coming out at the end of August is Fliha Hassan, a memoir, War and Me, from Amazon Crossing. And this is a book that I take special pride in because Fliha Hassan is an Iraqi refugee. She's an Iraqi feminist. Um, she's a, a poet. And several years ago, when she arrived in the United States, she sent me an email saying, hey, uh, why don't you translate some of my poems? And I said, OK, why not? And so I've been translating her poems and short stories for several years. And she writes very movingly about things that happened in her life, but also about things that were typical in Iraqi folk culture. And I wasn't sure always which was which. And just one thing I want to say about that, though, is that for both I'm in Seattle and, and War and Me, um, I was translating these memoirs as they were being written. So that gives the translator a whole kind of different impact on the, the final version. She and I are both really, really happy with the way it's turned out. And, and But this is sort of almost an experiment. Yeah, and it's one advantage one advantage of translating contemporary literature as well. I'm a medievalist, and uh, you know it's obviously very engaging for me. And I, I feel like I'm in a dialogue with these texts, but there's only so much you can do. I mean, you know, without without some strong smelling salts, uh, being able to bring these people to, to life. Um, but it's, I think, a lot more satisfying, at least in this respect, to, uh, to work with, you know, the author on, on a project. Uh, you translated a fictionalized account, among your other, you know, works that have come out recently, a fictionalized account of Ibn Arabi's life by a Saudi novelist and a scholar. Uh, I'm aware that he has a PhD from Carleton University, Muhammad Hassan Alwan. And the title is Ibn Arabi's Small Death, which is out this year from University of Texas Press. And it won the 2017 International Prize for Arabic Fiction, which is known informally as the Arabic Booker. A medieval Sufi mystic, William, is this an unlikely subject for a present day novel? Um, no, I mean, why Why not? He, he makes it very personal. I mean, it's like in Ibn Arabi's case, there's this nice lady who says, if you'll just purify your heart, you're really going to be special. Mm. You know, if you'll just be the nicest person you can be, 
but I mean, where do you begin? And and that's kind of what the novel's about. And there are these these uh, referees along your path who are not going to identify themselves. They're going to be watching to see whether you're good enough. Can you, uh, can you briefly summarize for listeners? I'm sure many of them are familiar with Ibn Adabi, but for those who might not be, can you briefly tell us who he was? Well, he's one of the most important and most controversial of all the Sufis, the mystics of Islam. And he began life in, in Muslim Spain and traveled through most of the Islamic world of his day, teaching and, and um, trying to become a better person. Yeah. And you mentioned before about um, this more personal side of, of Ibn Adabi and that that's kind of what comes through in this novel. I know at least one critic, Muhammad, or Mahmoud Husni, has criticized the novel for focusing too much on Ibn Arabi's imagined personal life and not enough on his ideas and teachings, which of course are, are very rich and prolific. But you in an interview have said that the novel is like St. Augustine's Confessions and it offers little slices of medieval life and that it's very much a, a lived experience, not a tedious history text. And what's, I guess I want to explore what the right balance is between historical facts and, and these imagined slices of life. And do you think that Adwan struck that balance in his novel. Oh, I, I think it's a fantastic novel. I think it's it's really excellent. And and that's that's why it's excellent, that it is such a lovely balance. Yeah, I mean it is meant for a contemporary reader. Um some of the things that, that may, you know, sort of touch a nerve or I don't know what. Um his treatment of slavery, Ibn Arabi's mother was a slave who became a free woman when she gave birth to him, a, a son. Um, and uh, when the cooking gets too much for her, her father buys a kitchen slave for her, and the kitchen slave becomes Ibn Arabi's kind of chaperone. Then when he thinks he needs to rush off to Mecca, he just sells his companion. And the other thing is race, and, and this is historically true. One of his disciples is a freed Ethiopian slave who becomes uh, Ibn Arabi's almost inseparable companion for decades. And um, in our novel, anyway, dies of leprosy. And, and the whole sort of race slavery at, at, at a sort of lived personal level in, in terms of, you know, America sort of coming to terms with its slave history, I, I find touching, but it may also touch a, a nerve for people. Yeah. Yeah, to see, to see, to sort of be looking in the mirror, uh, but through the lens of or a mirror of you know from over a thousand years right. ago. Right. Um, and, and do you think these these points sort of come up organically from the story? Oh yes, yes. You know, I mean, I think that's that's what's nice about it. I mean, there there is a lot of you know sort of trumping through back alleys in the Middle Ages, which is fun. They discover an Egyptian boy playing with an Egyptian boomerang. They're, they're just little slices of life, and but it, it's all sort of woven into the fabric. When he received the International Prize for Arabic Fiction in 2017, Muhammad Alwan said this, It might seem odd to write a novel about Ibn Arabi with all those extremely Eastern concepts whilst residing in this distant cold corner of the world in Canada. I realized that being exposed to what is seemingly foreign or different is what drives me to reconnect with myself, as well as with my heritage and old culture. To the skeptic, William, who might be thinking, you know, why should we read a novel about someone who lived so long ago and lived a life that might be very different from mine? What new connections can English readers make by reading Ibn Adabi's Small Death? Well, okay, so almost any city in the United States currently has one or more Sufi orders active. And if you don't look for Sufis, you don't necessarily find them, but they're here. There certainly are Americans who are trying to follow some kind of Sufi path. But one of, one of my nephews went straight from high school into the army. He's read Ibn Arabi's Small Death without any college, without any sort of fancy pants pretensions. And he he um, said it introduced him to Sufism and that he enjoyed reading it. They're, they're just slices of life that I think anybody can relate to. And finally, let's hear a brief passage from this novel, Muhammad Hassan Alwan's work about uh, Ibn Adabi. Okay, so here we go. One summer, my father decided he would teach me how to swim, shoot, and ride a horse. 
He started with swimming, which I had hated since I heard the tale about the Normans sailing up the river. Even so, I plunged into the water to swim, accompanied by Saloum, the kitchen slave, who obeyed my mother's command to cling to me like a bracelet. Isn't that nice? Cling to me like a bracelet? Unlike the Segura River, which was shallow and flowed slowly, Seville's River was cold and there were sharp rocks in the bottom. My father shouted at me, jump in here and swim from here to there. Then he threw a metal flutter in the river and commanded, retrieve that. These lessons continued fruitlessly. I hated swimming and the filthy river disgusted me. My father didn't grasp that the real swimmer glides through God's spiritual dominion, the Malakut. That genuine target practice is speaking truth in alarming circumstances. The true horseback riding is travel and pursuit of learning. My father embraced the exoteric meanings while God disclosed the esoteric ones to me. My father forced me to do stuff I didn't like and ordered me to do things I couldn't stand. One day he became so infuriated by my recalcitrance that he ordered me to stay in the river till I swam from one shore to the other. I wept and begged him not to make me, but he insisted. The current was strong and the water was cold. My father stood frowning on the bank with his arms crossed, casting severe looks my way. I swam to the middle of the river, but my arms failed me there, and I struggled to keep my head above water. When I finally reached the other bank and climbed out, my father began yelling at me to swim back. He even threw rocks at me. Tired, afraid, shivering from the cold, I slipped into the water and swam a short distance before I felt the current drag me downstream. Then I noticed my father and Saloum were running along the bank to catch up with me. Finally, Saloum leapt into the water and pulled me to a place where we could both climb out. On our way home, my father walked ahead of us and said nothing. My body was trembling because I felt cold and frightened. I pulled my shirt up to cover my head and continued walking, even though I couldn't see the road or feel my feet. The icy cramps I experienced down my back made my shoulder blades contract. Once I began to shake convulsively, Saloum took my arm. Then I lost control of my bladder and felt warm liquid run down my thighs. Finally, when my feet failed me, Saloum hoisted me onto his back. Entering our neighborhood, I glimpsed our pine tree and passed out. And then there's a chapter break, a new chapter, and there's a little quote from Ibn Arabi, how wary I am of my wariness. Okay, so here we go. Um, and I'm going to skip some more. There's a benevolent um, sheikh who appears. I asked him, who are you, uncle? He turned toward me, opened his mouth, and seemed to reply, Yasin, by the judicious Quran, you are surely one of the messengers. I found that my father was chanting these verses when I forced my eyes open. He was seated cross-legged by my head, holding his hand on my forehead. I closed my eyes again so he would continue the recitation. On the straight path, a revelation of the compassionate Almighty to warn people whose fathers were not admonished, so they were clueless. I allowed my father to recite the entire chapter again and again without letting him know I had regained consciousness. Isn't that sweet? That is, those are very interesting snippets um, and a, you know, kind of wide array of uh, a mosaic of, of different experiences. William, thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. You're most welcome. Thank you.